good evening. My name is Lloyd Coleman, and I'm the Associate Music Director of Power Orchestra. Alongside me, Charlotte Harding, a composer, arranger, and a regular collaborator with the Power Orchestra. This pre-concert uh, talk will follow quite the same format as your kind of conventional talk. We're not going to be discussing the music in tonight's programme in terms of its context and where it came from and how it came to be in the way you normally would because Charles Hazelwood, our founder and artistic director, will be doing just that during the gig itself. So he has a very personal connection with this music that he will be exploring throughout the evening. So instead, um, Charlotte and I are going to talk a little bit more generally about the work of the Power Orchestra and really some of the uh, challenges and opportunities of working with such a group of musicians. I'm a composer and I play clarinet in the Power Orchestra. I've been involved with the Power Orchestra since its formation in 20, uh, 2012. It was founded by Charles Hazelwood and we made our debut, if you like, our international debut at the closing ceremony of the Paralympic Games in London. And we've come a long way uh, since then. We're now based in Bristol. And the purpose, I suppose, of the Power Orchestra is twofold, mainly. The first uh, has its clue in the name, Power Orchestra. We exist to provide opportunities for professional disabled musicians to play on a world-class stage. Many of those disabled musicians don't often have the opportunities that they uh, need or deserve because often the stages aren't accessible, for instance, for wheelchair users. We're sat here in a modern concert hall, a very beautiful concert hall in Manchester, which is accessible, but many older halls, for instance, in the UK, you cannot access the stage easily if you are a wheelchair user and an instrumentalist. The, 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 the limitations or the restrictions or the barriers are that fundamental. And uh, the second reason we exist, or the, the second thing we, we hope to do in the course of our work is to kind of reinvent or reimagine what the 21st century orchestra can look like, what it exists to do, which audiences it wants to reach. We do a whole range of projects um, around the UK and further afield, and we're very proud to be bringing this, our latest show, Tones, Jones and Arpeggios, here to Manchester. And Manchester, by the way, is a, a place that I have a very personal connection to. I um, studied um, at Cheatham School of Music just up the road, um, nearly 10 years ago now, which slightly terrified me to say that. Um, but uh, yeah, Cheatham is a place very close to my heart, and Manchester is a place that I spent four very, very happy years. Um, Charlotte. Hi. Welcome, thank you for <laughs> talking with me. Um, you, let's talk about your involvement in tonight's concert. You have realized two pieces by Pauline Oliveros. Do you want to tell us a little bit about what those pieces are and what that word realization actually means in this context? Yeah, so, um, so I was introduced to Pauline Oliveros by Charles. Um, every so often I get an email from Charles saying, have you heard this? Listen to this. And it can either be Barry White or it can be Pauline Oliveros, so you never know quite what you're going to get. Um, but she was uh, a pioneer of the idea of deep listening, so a lot of her music is um, drone-based, very atmospheric. And um, the two pieces that I realised tonight uh, were originally written for accordion and her EIS, I think she called it, her expanded instrument system. So she was um, putting the accordion through all sorts of electronic processes, so delays and filters and things, um, to create these incredible and, and really contemporary sounding um, worlds. And so Charles said, <laughs> Charles always likes to set me a challenge. In he his said, inimitable way. In his inimitable yeah. way, yes. <laughs> he said, um, could I realise these pieces for the ensemble, so for, um, for an orchestra? Um, and I think one of the amazing things about the Power Orchestra as a composer or an arranger when you're working with them is that the scope of instruments that I even just had to choose from in terms of how to go about realising these um, was really quite incredible from um, electronic instruments all the way through to um, standard conventional orchestral instruments. Um, so the first piece is called uh, The Last Time, that was the first one that I did. Yeah. 
and um, it's a it's a really beautiful piece. I very much suggest listening to to the original. Um, and uh, it's because it's it was originally written for accordion. I decided it could be cool to try and basically recreate an accordion with the instruments that I chose from the ensemble. So we've got some reed elements, some keyboard elements, um, all coming together to hopefully work as one. And then within that, featured members of the Power Orchestra, um, including Steve Varden on electronics and Victoria Awari singing uh, vocals as well. So I kind of set this, this palette and then started to reimagine it from there. And the second piece, the woman sees the world, how the world goes with no eyes, with another yeah. Pauline Ol Oliver number book, but with a very different kind of sound palette, I suppose. Yeah, so the, the second piece, we felt it would be nice if they contrasted, if they kind of took you into two very different worlds. So that's for um, strings and two guitar players who are playing uh, one with a bow and one with an e bow and a pair of pliers. Always ask Adrian <laughs> Utley, well, how else can you play it? Because he gets out all these amazing things. So yes, look out for the pliers. <laughs> they sound very cool. Adrian Utley is, a, is a really a guitar magician, I Actually. would say. <laughs> he knows every which way you can play an electric guitar and not play an electric guitar, as a case may be. So, I just want to explore, before we talk more about the power orchestra and how we go about working with some of the more unusual um, instruments and voices in power orchestra, what we mean by realising a piece of Pauline Oliveira. We've deliberately not used the word arrange. We were given a very kind permission for you to do this by Pauline Oliveira of his estate. Um, can we explore a little bit about what that actually means? Why, why we've used that term rather than arranging? Yeah, I mean, I think with her music, it was very much based in improvisation a lot of it, I think. And it has that air to it. And I think, um, it, for me, it would never work if it was an absolutely you know, note for note kind of um, interpretation of it. I think realize kind of it gives you a bit more um, breadth to for the ensemble to actually really bring themselves to it. Um, it's interesting, actually. They're I mean they're both I guess similar pieces in terms of they were written for accordion, but a woman sees is a standard kind of orchestral score. Whereas the last time I actually ended up. It's a graphic score, really. It's all kind of lines and bars, and I think in that way it gives that opportunity to, yeah, to realise for everyone to bring themselves to it and to realise it for themselves. Mm. I guess. In that totally. Way. I definitely feel that as you feel playing. Like playing it, yeah. The, yeah. The, the, the playing clarinet in the last time, and the way you presented the score is, is liberating and allowed. We were all, all of the musicians were listening to the original Pauline Oliveira recording. Uh, very closely, as well as studying Charlotte's um, kind of score for her realization, which then allowed us to kind of climb inside that world of Pauline and Oliveira because it's really unlike any other music I know. Um, it's, it's, it's highly um, individual, and you really, it, it's a kind of experience to play this music, not just an act to play it. And you really have to climb inside the, the sort of the sensibilities of, of what Pauline Oliveira is after. I think it's very human music. I think mm. it's very emotive. And uh, the more I listen to it and the themes of it all, it's all this idea of, it was originally a part of the dance work called Ghost Dances. Um, and so it's this idea of ghosts in Mexican culture and environmental ghosts in towns like Monterey in Mexico. And, and so, yeah, I think it's very emotive. And I can see Victoria when she's singing it really connecting to the, to the material. A lot of what she's doing tonight is improvised. Um, so yeah, I think Realize it just gives you that scope to to uh, interpret as you feel. Absolutely. Um, let's talk a little bit more about um, some of the individuals in the Power Orchestra. Um, tonight we have a band of, at uh, its uh, maximum, uh, 36 players. Um, around 40% of those players identify as disabled. Um, and with all of our projects now, we integrate disabled and non-disabled talent. Uh, that's the way we feel is, is the most um, effective and equalizing way to bring disabled musicians into the mainstream onto stages like the Bridgewater Hall's main stage. Um, we have a range of musicians in tonight's uh, concert out of that 40%. Out of that I'd like to talk about um, one or two of them a little bit more uh, because we have all kinds of disabilities in the power orchestra, um, but 
actually quite a high number of visually impaired and blind musicians. And of course that brings um, all kinds of interesting um, complications. If you're a blind musician, then you will learn the music often using braille music. It's a whole system of music that you can use to learn your part ahead of the first rehearsal, of course. Um, blind musicians don't have um, the, quite obviously, they don't have the ability to sight read a score in the rehearsal, so in many ways I feel that if you aren't relying on your sight, then often you will learn the score even more thoroughly, not just your own part, but actually the part of everyone else in the group as well, because that is the only way you can, um, or it's one of the ways in which you can contribute most effectively. Um, What's been your experience, Charlotte, of, of not maybe just in tonight's concert, but generally with Power Orchestra, working with some of those musicians? Yeah, I mean, I think it's amazing because it kind of shows you just how incredible all over again music is in the sense that there are a range of people on the stage tonight who are all approaching music in a very different way. Everyone's come from very different backgrounds. So some people have learned their music orally, some people have sort of made guide tracks of certain things and you know, put their line a little bit higher and they've learned it that way. Some people have learned big braille parts, some people have got um, structure sheets, so kind of writing down the narrative of, of the parts and they like to learn it that way. Um, others have standard notation braille parts. So yeah, I think it kind of shows just the breadth of musicianship and the different types of musicianship that are, that's on, you know, involved with the, in the orchestra. And it does create more work for you as a composer where you have to maybe think more carefully about how you present your parts. And we were talking yesterday, weren't we, about how often, uh, as composers, if you're working with, say, the BBC Phil or the Halle, um, you might be given a, a commission, um, sent an anonymous email from someone in the you know, development department. Uh, they might say how many um, musicians you are going to write for. None of those musicians have names. They're just, you know, two clarinets, two flute, two oboes, you know, string section, whatever. You get your five or six months to write the piece and then you deliver it, you know, via the same slightly anonymous email address at the other end and then you turn up for one day of rehearsal and then you do the gig. Um, and actually, although, you know, that way of working is incredibly streamlined and incredibly effective for those orchestras, actually there is something really nice about developing a more personal relationship with the musicians ahead of the rehearsal and during the rehearsal. Completely. I mean, I, it's my favourite thing about working with this ensemble is that um, they are world-class musicians and, you know, just from my perspective as a composer, I'm getting to talk to them. I mean, I've been discussing with Steve for about six weeks ahead of this gig and, you know, learn all about how he plays his instruments and get his knowledge and, and I, I, yeah, I think it's really nice in the sense of we're not... I never feel like I'm writing for instrumental forces. It's, I feel like I'm writing for people and I feel like I'm getting to know them better with every project that we do and I think that collaborative approach at the end of the day it always means an amazing musical experience for everybody and, and we're all kind of involved in getting this to, to the point of the performance and yeah, it's, it's one of my favourite things about working with the Power Orchestra is, is getting to know everybody and yeah, being a part of the team in that way. Well, you are part of the team now. You're, you're okay. definitely one of us, <laughs> um, kind of uh, associate artists. Um, you, you've worked with us several times before, and I we hope you'll work with us again. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, let's talk about some of those other projects. Uh, back in the summer, uh, we did um, a project around, you mentioned his name earlier, Barry White. Barry White. Yes, that Barry White yeah. of Love <laughs> and Limited fame. Um, extraordinary uh, gig at Glastonbury Festival on the park stage. Um, we took an integrated orchestra, um, the, the power orchestra, to the park stage, and um, it was a glorious summer day. If you can remember, the, well, in the earlier part of the summer when we had some nice weather, um, tell us a little bit about that process and climbing inside Barry White's music. Very different to Pauline Oliveira, I imagine. I mean, I'm up for doing a mashup. I feel at some point that needs to happen. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, totally different. That was um, eleven. Barry White songs uh, that I arranged for for the ensemble, um, and um, but it, I mean I guess it, it's still a similar process of just getting to know all the people in the ensemble, learning who does what, who would like to solo on which which piece, you know who's going to sing which piece, um, and uh, I mean I'm a now quite huge Barry White converted fan. Honestly, he is a genius. Really getting into his music, I think 
the musical material, but also the production of his songs and uh, the way that we were able to sort of bring that to life on the gig. Um, yeah, it was amazing. And, and your involvement in, in that um, gig itself and in the other project that we'll talk about in a minute as a composer was also kind of enhanced. Yes, yeah. So um, Charles, I'm on this journey. Another one of Charles' yeah. ideas. <laughs> Another good email. <laughs> He's like, how about if we close mic all of the instruments in the orchestra, send them to a mixing desk, um, and then you as a composer can then be manipulating the orchestra live. So putting flutes through a certain reverb or trumpets through a certain type of delay. Um, so for me, it's basically a whole other level of orchestration, basically. Um, so it meant that we had, this is my favourite one, the, the bass clarinet going through a wah wah pedal. So, um, who knew? Highly recommend <laughs> Lloyd that. sounds excellent yeah. through a wah wah pedal. <laughs> I can definitely do that. Um, yeah, so it's, it's so exciting because it kind of opens up this whole, as I say, a whole other layer of how to compose, how to orchestrate, how to. I think, especially in the power orchestra, bring together this hybrid of acoustic and uh, electronic instruments mm -hmm. because obviously through um, uh, you know, a lot of power orchestra players are using technology, yeah. it's, there's huge, very exciting developments in assisted technology yeah. um, that are going on that are being completely brought into the fold with ensembles like this. Um, so then yeah, it opens up all these possibilities of putting a bass clarinet with a synthesizer in it mm -hmm. and it kind of working together. And, yeah, it was a very dimensional way, I think, of, of, of looking at Barry White. <laughs> sure, and I suppose that it does speak to the heart of what I was talking about at the beginning, where, you know, actually reinventing what the orchestra can sound like and what it looks like, and using um, some of these other musicians who maybe in the past have been um, denied a platform, using them as an opportunity, an artistic opportunity, to do something different with the orchestra and to be more flexible and to be more nimble with how we approach these um, kind of challenges. The project before that, um, the very first project you joined us for, Craftwork Rework, um, was a project that we worked on together. Um, and again, there's a clue in the title of this one, Craftwork Rework. We, we took um, Trans Europe Express, um, a seminal Craftwork album. It was a wonderful experience to, we, we took a 40-piece power orchestra. Um, and again, you were, behind the mixing desk at the back, monitoring what was going on. We close mic to every member of that orchestra and then fed the whole orchestra through the mixing desk and you were able to kind of crush, filter and sweep things and turn the entire orchestra into a kind of uh, quasi-giant synthesizer, um, which was really cool. And then because of the nature of that music, which um, me and Charlotte um, kind of wrote much more um, what's the word I'm looking for here, like sort of heavy, yeah. um, dance-inspired, rock-inspired, um, obviously electronica-inspired music, um, we can then take that program to all kinds of other venues. So we did it in a, a nightclub in Bristol, in our home city of Bristol, um, at Motion Nightclub, and had people raving out to this music, which was a sort of one-of-a-kind experience. Um, what were your sort of reflections on, on that? Do you know, it's a really special piece. Mm -hmm. It was lovely to collaborate with Lloyd. Um, but I, I always remember the very first time we played it at the Simple Things Festival yeah. in Bristol, and it was the first um, power orchestra gig that I'd done. And I just remember, you know, we had all the rehearsals, and it suddenly just happened. And I say like people were dancing, and you know, and afterwards I just I remember this moment going up in the lift to find everyone afterwards, and having this moment of quiet, and just thinking, this is something else. <laughs> like, this is not an orchestral project or gig or, you know, that I've ever experienced before. And um, actually, I think um, the journalist Chief Rogers just wrote a really lovely piece about the Power Orchestra. It's on the website, isn't it? Yes, um, And I tweeted this because it so resonated with me. She put, um, you know, there's something new happening here. And that's exactly how I felt after that first Kraftwerk gig. It, as a composer, but also just as an you know, admirer of the Power Orchestra, it just felt like we are opening whole new doors musically and with the people who are involved and how it's being presented. Um, yeah, it just felt very new and exciting. And yeah. Fantastic. Um, let's bring it back to tonight's gig. Um, any more general thoughts from you about uh, minimalism, uh, perhaps even just beyond Pauline Oliveros? Um, 
I don't know how many people in the room are, are um, major minimalism nuts or whether you're coming to this music for the first time or whether you're trying it out. It, um, it, I mean, I'm certainly I'm in love with it um, and have been for some time. Uh, what's your, what would be your kind of uh, summary of minimalism? Um, so I had a bit of a minimalism thing in August. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> doing this gig, so I went totally into that world. I, for me, I think the reason why it's so special is because it's it's very human and also very mechanical at the same time. It kind of brings these two things together. It's music that's based on processes and um, yeah, mechanics, yet somehow is completely human, emotive, takes you somewhere else, makes you listen in a very different way. I mean, I, I can't stress how listening to a Pauline Oliveros track at the start of August and listening to it again at the end of August, I'm hearing two totally different pieces of music. So I think for me, that's, yeah, and it's, it's an amazing gig and we've got so many people involved mm -hmm. with this and an incredible, I just have to say, an incredible crew and stage crew and production team behind this orchestra that make all of this work. It really is quite incredible. Yeah. So, yeah. No, absolutely, hear, hear. And I, I think for me, that minimalism, I think playing it um, is very, it, it's sort of almost, I would describe it as you'd have to change your kind of musical metabolism a little bit. So we're so used to, um, uh, Charles um, talked a lot about kind of goal orientation in music um, and music that kind of goes towards somewhere, which as a player, you know, really matters in, in any given phrase or any given movement of a piece. You're always thinking about where the, where the climax of that piece is, where, you, where the nub of the piece is in, in any stretch of time. And minimalism suddenly is about allowing yourself to, to focus maybe just on one note or one pattern of notes or one rhythm and to play the same pattern of notes for two, three, four, five, six minutes perhaps. And it, you know, for that reason, it is very, very difficult, um, I would say. And I've learned that from doing this project. Before I knew a lot of minimalist music and loved it as a composer, and listening to it is one thing, but actually playing it is, is a whole other um, ball game of um, being athletic and being physically um, up for it and physically kind of prepared for it, especially as a wind player. You know, to some of the, the pieces in tonight's. Um, concert, uh, you may see me going slightly, well, the colour of my trousers, red trousers. <laughs> um, you know, it is quite a hardcore play, some of it, um, and so you have to really train for it, you know, in, in the same way that a, an athlete might train for an event, um, and really get the, the embouchure and the everything, you know, working in the right way. Um, but, yes, at the same time, despite all that kind of activity happening, in the moment and that sort of physical exertion, actually there's this, this larger thing happening and this larger effect of the music, which is really quite um, magical, actually. Um, just another note uh, ahead of the concert at 7.30. It won't have uh, escaped your notice that uh, there's a big screen behind us and um, the wonderful filmmaker John Minton, who I think is just on a break at the moment, um, but he has uh, created some extraordinary uh, imagery for tonight's concert. If you would like to um, listen to the audio description of that imagery, then please pick up a headset uh, from a member of staff um, at, at the front of the, uh, outside, <laughs> in the foyer. Um, they'll be very happy to give it to you, even if you're not visually impaired or blind. If you would like, if you are curious to listen to the audio description, then you're very welcome to. I found it um, in the past a really fascinating um, uh, another level, another level of um, enjoyment and fascination, and um, hopefully it uh, kind of symbolises again that you know we want to make all of our concerts um, as open to as many people as possible, and to just reassess for plenty of other people as, as, as providing audio description, but just actually thinking very carefully about what the experience of the concert is for all members of the audience and not for those who um, maybe come, you know, week in, week out or, you know, feel very comfortable in a concert hall. I think, Charlotte, unless you have anything else you'd like to add, you're good? Yeah.
Thank you all very much for coming, and I hope you enjoy the evening. Thank you. Thank you.